Well, when you think about risk, I mean, we use the word so loosely, it essentially says we don't know what's going to happen. Elroy Dimson at Harvard Business School put it, risk means more things can happen than will happen. And that's a fancy way of saying the same thing. It's a range of outcomes, and we don't know where it's going to fall within that range. Often we don't even know what the range is. Essentially, risk means we don't know what's going to happen, which is an interesting thought when you really sit and look at it. Uh, first of all, it means that good things can happen as well as bad things. Our instinct says risk means we're in danger, but it doesn't. It just means we're in the, in the unknown and there's uncertainty. I believe with a passion this statement that we don't know what the future holds. Easy to say, a lot of people, I mean, they give it lip service or they shake their heads yes, but they go on acting as though they do know. And I think this is such a big, overwhelming idea about life that we walk every moment into the unknown. No, I don't think you should shave it down into something. That This has to be in your, in your head and in your gut all the time. When things happen differently from the way we expect or the way we anticipate or the way we plan, that doesn't mean you're a fool. That's in the nature of, of life. If you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know what's going to happen. And so mistakes are an inevitable part of the process. And what risk management really means Things are going to be different from what we expect from time to time, and how well prepared are we to deal with when it's different? Starting in the post-war years after World War II, maybe as a consequence of this enormous shock of World War II, people began to think in more sophisticated fashion about risk. I mean, something more than probability. The most important development and recognized with Nobel Prizes is Arrow de Brut, that you can begin to think about risk as kind of a set of scenarios that if you tried to put some kind of a handle on the different outcomes that might happen with the recognition that you never get 100% of it, you begin to think in a more systematic fashion. But just the sense of the normal curve to the distributions and where events might fall and what the structure of the distribution is gives you a big leg up on dealing with if you're wrong, how wrong are you going to be and what the consequences are? The second is a very simple one, but it's now pervasive. Harry Markowitz, who won one of the first Nobel Prizes in finance, in 1952, he didn't know anything about finance, but he thought he liked to use that as a framework for thinking about trade-offs. How do you measure trade-offs? And he said in, in investing... You have to think about risk as well as return. To me, this is a, a, a thunderbolt of a statement. The Markowitz idea was very slow. First of all, people in Wall Street didn't like to be told this. People in Wall Street didn't like mathematical models. I, mean, I forgot it was referred to as baloney, this stuff. People in Wall Street don't like to think about equilibrium or efficiency because they believe they know so much that it's easy to beat the market so that the intellectual acceptance was, it, it was repulsion rather than acceptance. But after the experience of the 1970s, where kind of everybody turned out to be wrong, from the President of the United States and the head of the Federal Reserve System on down, there was much more humility. And I think it's only in very recent years, at least in finance, that things have become more formalized than they were and less seat of the pants than they had been. Resistance to thinking about risk in a more systematic manner will diminish. I just think it's in the nature of the process. Uh, sometimes these things are helped by a crisis or by bad news. And to think that something with a small probability is not going to happen tomorrow, when it could happen at any moment. There is a large area of stuff that we don't know, and we never will know. We do our best, but there's always that gray area. And the interesting question is not how you're going to find out what that is, because you can't by definition, but how do you deal with it when it happens? The idea of an option is such a powerful idea, and it took people a long time to understand all of the uses that it might have. The key thing about an option is that it's a right, not an obligation. You have an opportunity, but you don't have to take it. And so at its heart, this means waiting because we'll see what happens, then I'll decide whether I want to do it. And so this can influence important business decisions. I, I want to build a plan. I have a great idea for a new business, whatever. Um, 
Do I have to do it now? Suppose I decide to wait. What is it worth to me to have the additional information that I will have with the passage of time? If I'm absolutely convinced that I have to do this now or that somebody's going to catch up to me, I'll do it now. But that means that I can't afford to wait. But suppose I think I can afford to wait. What is that worth to me? And can I do it better if I wait with more information and, and more opportunity to think it through? This is a big idea. Business people intuitively have, have done that for a long time. But this is a way of using option pricing, which essentially is a function of the degree of uncertainty in the outcome. Using that to put a value on waiting, that's a stupendous idea. Long-term capital management, which was probably the, the primary example of, of high-powered mathematical modeling of, of people who were geniuses in the, in the bond market. They developed very elegant models for uh, make, taking risks in the bond market. And that every kind of risk management thing that you can think of, the only thing they forgot was that all of those models were based on a world in which LTCM did not exist. Once long-term capital management came into the picture and the markets knew that these geniuses who had come from some of those were operating there, the responses were different from what the models of the field had changed. And too much dependence on the math, you lose sight of the dynamics, you lose sight of, of uh, that the world really moves and, and that it's a complex system. There's a fellow named Rick Bookstable who's been in the risk management business for a long time who talks about the cockroach. And it's funny, but it's a very important lesson. The cockroach has a, he uses the expression coarse risk management system, C-O-A-R-S-E. At the slightest hint of danger, he runs like hell. And this species has lasted through billions and billions of years, one of the oldest species, because at any sign of danger, it runs like hell. Now, you can't, in, in our world, you can't exist if at the first sign of danger, you run like hell. But clearly, there are things where a course decision-making process is more important than a model and something that's been tested on the data. There is a large area of stuff that we don't know, and we never will know. Uh, we, we, we do our best, but there's always that gray area. 